Our first guest is Chris Warner. He is a candidate for Secretary of State. He joins us via telephone where uh, yesterday Chris made his official announcement that he would be running for the Secretary of State's position that will be open since his older brother, Mac Warner, will be pursuing, of course, uh, the governor's chair. Chris, good morning. Thanks for joining us today. Good morning, uh, Rob, Admiral, Sergeant. Good, good to, morning. Good to be with you this morning. Great to have you. Tell us about your decision that brought you to the point of announcing for this office. You know, I had last night the um, the opportunity to um, to speak to a, a group of uh, folks who, quite frankly, represented 39 counties of our 55 counties at uh, an announcement. And I had the opportunity to start off and pass along the message I, I learned a lesson that I learned from my older brother Buffy who's now deceased uh, he, he he was running for the for the state Senate uh, back in 1988 and it was he, he was the first Republican in 90 years to be elected from Montegalia and Marion counties but he taught me back in 88 35 years ago uh, that you become a citizen first uh, by registering to vote and vote in every election, and that makes you a citizen in your community. And you choose to do that, and you choose to become an activist uh, after that. You, you pick up uh, candidates that you want to support, a, a ballot issue that you're either for or against, and, and you do everything you can to either elect that candidate or you know vote for or against a, a ballot issue. And again, that, that makes you an activist. But he goes, you will wake up someday and you'll look and see either who's in office or who is running for that office, as is the case for me. And uh, he goes, you're going to realize that you can do a better job uh, than that, uh, that person uh, that's running for that office. And he goes, at that point, you have an obligation to run. It's not a choice anymore. It's an obligation. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm right now serving as the executive director of the Economic Development Authority. It's a great job getting to be involved with economic development all over this state. But I woke up 57 days ago on October 12th and, and realized I could do better than, uh, you know, who had uh, just signed up to, to run for office. And um, I, d I decided that this was the this was the time uh, to to be involved and uh, be able to provide accountability and accessibility and and transparency and build upon the foundation that um, Mac, quite frankly, has has started in that office. Chris, is it uh, true that you will uh, uh, spare no criticism of the current incumbent as, as you completely disagree with what he's done in his job <laughs> as the Secretary of State? <laughs> I tell you what, uh, they have built a foundation there. Uh, I'm I'm not afraid to uh, to disagree when I need to, but uh, they have built a foundation in that office, and uh, to see what they and the 55 county clerks have done in removing over you know 400,000 names from our voter rolls, uh, it's going to be a tough act to follow. But we're ready to take it to the next level if uh, I have the opportunity to. Uh, to be elected. You were the Republican Party chair from 2000 to 2004, where the seeds were sown for what would eventually be a supermajority in the House of Delegates and Senate and a complete sweep of the constitutional offices in the state of West Virginia. Can you tell me about some of the moves that you made in those early days to help turn the tide from complete Democratic dominance in the state to what we see today? You know, uh, first of all, I started out as a, a county chairman in Montegalia County, uh, served there for, for two years, and then was recognized for what we were doing in Montegalia County and was elected by the state executive committee um, in the state chairman's role. And, you know, we we went out and tried to, tried to raise money, and we had, we had uh, donors saying, why would I give to the Republican Party when I show up? And there's no one on the ballot. You know, why, why would we give? So then we went out and we tried to recruit candidates. And they said, you know, why, why would we run? Or, you know, people that have made a mark in the community, why would we run? We can't raise enough money to, to, be, a, uh, to be elected. So it was a kind of a chicken or egg thing. Um, and we realized that we had to bring all that together. And that's, you know, I think that's what I did as, as state chairman. Um, and then we we quickly realized that 
you have to challenge every House of Delegates race every two years, 100 seats and 17 state Senate seats um, in every election. And because we found if if you only had 60 people running for the House of Delegates as, as Republicans, the Democrats would team up and help, uh, you know, the, the you know, two Democrat office holders would team up and help uh, across the border, across their district lines. And we realized we had to challenge every seat and then pick those those races that had the best chance of success and and funding those candidates and making sure that they could raise the money they needed to raise. And uh, it took a little bit longer than what we thought. You know, we with that, my, my years as state chairman, you know, went from 2000 to 2005, and then there were other efforts that I was involved with as a national committee man when we finally got to flip uh, the House and the Senate and uh, sweep those constitutional offices, uh, you know, to Republicans. Bill. Yeah, good morning, Chris. Uh, Bill Stubblefield. Uh, you also ran for state Senate, did you not? Admiral, I did. Um, yeah. Bill Cole uh, okay. at the time uh, encouraged me to uh, to run for the state Senate. I did everything I could, man. I thought we raised raised a lot of money. It was a hundred thousand dollars in that state Senate uh, seat. But uh, again, I was in a very uh, liberal county of Monongalia and uh, just couldn't couldn't overcome that. I actually won Marion County, the two county uh, district and uh, was defeated by just a few votes. And uh, uh, that was enough for, uh, for, the, for the time until this, uh, this opportunity arose and uh, a need to, to run for Secretary of State. Uh, you mentioned one of the reasons you ran, because you felt that the individuals running would not, these are my words, not yours, uh, were not up to the job. I think t two of the individuals are Ken Reed and Chris Pritt, uh, both of which have held elected office. Uh, why do you think that you are more qualified to be Secretary of State than Reed and Pritt? I think Doug Scaff's name's in there, Doug too. Doug Scaff, I missed it. Okay. Well, and, and, and it, it was really what I made reference to there, you know, 57 days ago on October 12th was getting up and reading the Charleston Gazette. And it is Doug Scaff. I mean, Doug, Doug Scaff, uh, you know, I don't have a, a bad thing to say about Ken Reed or or Chris Pritt or any of the other candidates that have, uh, you know, announced their intention to run. But, you know, when you have the torch carrier for the for the Democrat Party, the Democrat leader uh, in the House of Delegates resign as a Democrat, meaning that the governor needed to pick a Democrat to replace him, and then switch parties uh, and register as a Republican and file to run for one of the most impactful offices in the state on the you know, virtually the, you know, the same day, um, I, I determined that this you know, was not going to happen in my Republican Party. I mean, this this guy has vote after vote after vote that is just carrying the you know the woke agenda, you know the Joe Biden agenda out of D.C. and I'm not going to allow it to occur on my watch. Uh, I've worked too hard, 35 years building this Republican Party. Uh, we're we're not going to let that happen. Mike Height. Good morning, Chris. Uh, Good my, morning, qu sir. my question is: so, you know, Brother Mac uh, has been doing this for a few years, and ha in my opinion, has done an excellent job uh, as Secretary of State. So, my question to you is: what are you going to do to tweak it and make it your own, or are you just going to continue on with the the uh, the great changes that he's made? Well, to, again, to start, you know, I mentioned that you know they have uh, built an excellent foundation and you know mac has fought uh federal overreach at, at every turn and, and done a, a tremendous job but you know i think that i can take my experiences and I've, i had the opportunity to lead economic development for president trump in west virginia and then uh, you know most recently and and right now i have the opportunity to lead the economic development authority which is you know the state's bank um for for economic development projects uh but one example that i'll give you to be you know very uh, specific is right now as it relates to accountability um the secretary of state's office 
depends on the public or an opponent in an election to see something, let's say on a, on a finance report, and say something and file a complaint. Uh, and then the Secretary of State's office does a tremendous job in investigating that and, and doing what they need to do to, to build the, the case. But I think that we could probably reassign. I'm not talking about adding uh, new employees, but uh, maybe it's a reassignment of just two employees in the office to look at every line on every report that is filed as it relates to elections. And on the business side, everything that is done, you can look at line by line by line and then take an, a, a, an aggressive approach. And again, this is nothing negative on the, the job that Mac has done, but it's taken it to that next level so that we can comply with state code instead of depending on the, the public catching it. Um, you know, they tend to catch technical errors, but we can find the bad actors and build a case and, and go after those folks if, if there's you know, wrongdoing and, and what they're filing with the Secretary of State's uh, sure. office. So I also want to follow up on Bill's question. Um, and, and, you know, I understand um, – how you feel about Doug. Doug Scaff is, is obviously um, it resigned as a delegate and switched parties and is now a Republican. I, so I can understand uh, questioning his motives and, and where he is. Um, the other two I would consider uh, pretty conservative um, as it, when they were delegates. Um, so what is it about them that, that sets you apart? It's This is, you know, Many times people say West Virginia is a small state. You realize how big of a state it is when you try to, you know, crisscross the state and uh, and campaign, uh, you know, and hit all 55 counties. It's going to take someone that can raise the money to communicate the message uh, to, quite frankly, uh, you know, overcome the personal check that a Doug Scaff would 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 write. Uh, and I, I don't believe that, uh, that, you know, the other candidates, any of the other candidates, quite frankly, that have announced their, their interest in the Secretary of State's office will be able to do that and be able to communicate the, the message. Um, you know, we still allow uh, unaffiliated voters to vote in our uh, primary, and uh, it's just that many more people that need to be reached. And... Um, I think that I can do a, a much better job in uh, communicating that message and raising the money that it's going to take uh, to defeat someone that will pour a half a million dollars or more of their own money into this race. Chris Warner is our guest here on the program. He is a candidate for Secretary of State. Chris, uh, you mentioned about uh, non-affiliated members being able to vote in primaries, and obviously the Secretary of State doesn't have the power to change this. Uh but I, I'm not a fan of that. I've never been in favor of that. The whole nomination system is the party nominating their candidate and party members voting on who they want their candidate to be. It makes it pretty clear that a Republican candidate is a Republican chosen by fellow Republicans. When you allow non-affiliated members in, you run the risk of allowing people from outside your party to determine who your candidate will be. And we've seen examples of that in this state where that's happened to manipulate races. Would you pursue trying to end that with the legislature, or do you like the policy and hope to continue it? Well, I'm going to show how old I am now uh, and tell you that when I was state chairman, I brought forward the idea for unaffiliated voters to be able to vote in our primary, and it was mainly because we had counties where we were outnumbered as Republicans 9 and 10 to 1, and it was you know, maybe anecdotal evidence, but so many people that I talk to uh, would say my parents would roll over in their graves if I voted for a Republican or, you know, much less register as a Republican. So I took it to the state executive committee and uh, made the pitch as to why we needed to open the primary to unaffiliated voters. And I can tell you now, this many years later, we have done everything that we intended to do by opening up the primary and bringing unaffiliated voters over because we have now seen that those unaffiliated voters have recognized that they're really not Democrats and they're really not unaffiliated and they've made the switch. And we have taken 
um, you know, a majority in the number of registered voters across the state. So to to answer your question, I, I think it is time that we control our own destiny. And it's now, since we've accomplished the goal, uh, it's time to, uh, you know, narrow that, at least for the primary. I'm, obviously, we still want conservative Democrats and unaffiliated voters and need those folks in the general election. But this is about our primary and uh, running our party as we uh, see fit and see is uh, best for the state. Let me uh, kind of push back with Rob and push back what you said. Uh, approximately one third. Well, there's no disagreeing with the host on this program. You <laughs> fall in line or you get out the door. Get out the door. The rules and, are simple. And, and the door is magically open. <laughs> and Heights pushing me out. Yeah. Uh, but around one, around one third of our registered voters in the state are registered as unaffiliated. Mm-hmm. And I am one of those. And one of the reasons that we choose to do this is to give the flexibility. Uh, it's, it, we're not like Mississippi, uh, where if you're partisan on one side, you can vote uh, for the candidates on the other side of the aisle. Uh, the unaffiliates are generally just that. That does mean they have a leaning one, do not have a leaning one way or the other. Most of us do. Uh, but I think leaving it open, and, it's, it, and it's, I think I'm right on this, Chris, it's the party's decision. It's not the state's decision. It's not the legislature's decision. It's the party's decision whether they want to open their primary up or not. The Democrats had opened theirs up several years before. Republicans followed suit. Uh, uh, much more recently, uh, I think there's a real strength given the, the unaffiliates. The thirty percent. No, uh, I don't believe so. The thirty percent is thirty three percent. Do not deprive them of the opportunity to vote in the primary. Well, I will. I will just go back on a little bit of history and for the record, we opened the the primary first to unaffiliated voters. It was eight years later that the Democrats realized what was happening. It took them eight years to realize that we were gaining like we were gaining in party registration. And, and uh, they they decided to open up the, the primary to allow unaffiliated to vote in their, in their primary. Um, but I think we just, we have to take a very close look and, and determine if we want, as you say, close to one third. By the way, I looked at those numbers about a week ago, and uh, the the number of people that are registering as Republicans have have grown even more. It, you know, I thought it was one third, one third, one third, and uh, you know, the Republicans have taken a pretty clear majority. Uh, but again, it just it comes down to whether you want those that are registered as Republicans picking the Republican nominee, and. Uh, uh, unaffiliated can you know, uh, still be involved and still vote in the general election, uh, and uh, we will obviously work to, to earn their support as uh, as conservatives. But uh, I, I think that that uh, time has come, at least speaking from you know, my role as a former state chairman and a national committee man, and recruiting the best Republican candidates that we could find across the state. That uh, maybe this. Uh, We've accomplished that goal, and it's it's time now to control our own destiny. So we can all agree the admiral's wrong on this one. Uh, <laughs> I think just to make and, that underline and, that and, note right there, and, all, and also about the uh, the sequence of who approved first. My Kate was telling me I was that it was the Demo- uh, Republicans, and he was right. I'll give Mike full credit. It's a I tough morning for I, you, admiral. It is tough, a tough morning. morning. Yeah, <laughs> never get tired of hearing but, it. But I'm, but, but I'm but I'm not going to back off. I'm not going to shut up. Rob. <laughs> <laughs> Although there was, I will say that uh, you know I was on the executive, um, the executive Republican executive committee in Berkeley County for a while, and and we had talked about closing that back off to the, the independents, and I I think there was a concern for a while that there were some independents or even Democrats um, that were switching uh, parties to to unaffiliated so that they could vote in the primaries to affect um, the candidate that was chosen, you know, a a lesser candidate to run against the one they wanted. And, you know, 
Well, I think there may be some of that. I don't think it's enough to really influence a, a primary. But so. it could be. Uh, but it I, could be. Yeah, it's the absolutely. same reason why you require identification. Is sure. is there enough evidence that people who aren't who they say they are are voting to sway an election? But I think it looks bad upon you when you open things up like like Chris did when he did, and and it helps you gain. Um, Republicans on your side, you open things up, and then when when things start to turn, then you want to close it back down after the, re the Democrats open things up. It, it just well, it had a it had a bad look to it if you do that. Chris, well, um, I, I would just say that um, in 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 response that uh, the the people of West Virginia, I believe are conservative. Uh, they're conservative, uh, you know, both fiscally and, and socially. Uh, and the, the Republican party matches that. Um, and so we're, it's not a matter of opening and closing only to benefit the, Re the Republican party, but it's, uh, it, you know, we're going to have a, a fight, quite frankly, I think in 2024 in many races in the governor's race in the U S Senate race and in the secretary of state's race, for the heart and soul of the Republican Party, at least during the, the primary election. And uh, it's, it's an exciting time to, to be involved, and I'm, I'm glad to be there to, to rep, represent the, the conservative side of the Republican Party and, and match uh, you know, the values of uh, many West Virginians, whether they're registered as unaffiliated or whether they're registered as is Republican. We know they're conservative at heart. Chris, uh, it's not often we have siblings running for statewide offices. Will you and Mac find ways that you can mutually assist the other in your race? Uh, I'm, I'm always going to support uh, the best Republican uh, candidates running for office. And, uh, you know, I firmly believe that Mac is the best Republican candidate running for office uh, because of his experience, uh, because of the work that he has done as the Secretary of State. I mean, the guy's entire life has been about public service. Um, but at the same time, we run two very separate campaigns. I've been involved in helping Mac in his previous campaigns, uh, but I'm running my race for the Secretary of State now. And, and uh, you know, we have agreed weeks ago to... Uh, stop conversing about uh, each of our campaigns um so chris now the most the most important question for this interview is have you had max wife's rum cake <laughs> i don't know that i have i'll have to oh my uh, goodness ask debbie and tell her i need some uh, rum cake as a christmas present this year there you go max first I time think that you have yeah max first time in studio he brought us his wife's rum cake and we're like whoa oh my goodness Man, this is amazing a, what a what a suck up to show up and bring white rum cake. But it worked. It did it work. It did work. <laughs> it, it, it worked. He won. So uh, oh man, he, I'm gonna have to uh, I'm gonna have to take it up a notch. Uh, you next are. Time I'm in the Eastern Panhandle. You got a top of rum cake when you come by. Uh, <laughs> All right, Chris. A minute left. Final word to our audience is yours. What do you have to say? I'm just. Uh, Ask folks to do the research. Make sure you know who uh, the candidates are that are that are running for office, and uh, go support the very best candidate. I think in the Secretary of State's race, uh, I think my record will prove that uh, I, I can uh, take uh, the Secretary of State's office uh, to the next level and build upon that foundation that uh, Mac Warner has uh, started in the last seven years. Chris, thanks so much for your time this morning. Best of luck to you, sir. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Thank you Chris. all very much. Thank you.